My name is Laird Klingler. I'm a librarian with the Cornish Historical Society. Uh, we're here at the town office uh, to interview Dale Lawrence, and uh, Billy Sharp will be doing the filming. Uh, the date is April 27, uh, 2017. Well, Dale, thank you for coming. I've looked forward to this. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Right. Uh, could, you, could we start by telling us where and when you were born? Sure. I was born down on Long Island, um, down in Massapequa, Long Island, and July 28th of 1960. So we lived down there for just just before my sixth birthday. We moved up here to New Hampshire. Well, tell us tell us how you uh, happened to come to New Hampshire. Tell us about your link to the Upper Valley. Well, my grandmother and grandfather um, had moved up here, I believe, for just summers at the time. At the time, they owned what was called Pine Grove Cabins in Charlestown, New Hampshire, and. Um, so my mom wanted to be closer to her, her mother, and my grandmother wanted to be closer to her grandchildren. So my parents decided to leave Long Island and move to New Hampshire. Um, at the time when they came up, they did not have a home yet. Uh, we stayed with my grandmother and grandfather. And um, then my parents saw um, the house at the end of South Deming Road and uh, decided that that was what they'd like to call home. It had 16 acres at the time, so us, four of us at the time um, had plenty of running around room and space, and then we had a younger sister born to us a couple years later. So, but my grandmother and grandfather converted the Pine Grove cabins into a motel, and the motel was called the Red Robin Motel because the robin was a early indicator of spring and my grandmother couldn't wait to see spring. Great, great. She would shovel snow onto the pavement to uh, make it melt faster. So uh, so how many, how many brothers and sisters then? I you? have two older brothers. I am a twin, a fraternal twin, and uh, I have a younger sister. Um, we're kind of spread out or across. My older, oldest brother Jim lives in Washington, the state of Washington. And my brother Ed lives in Charlestown, um, and my two sisters Diana and Patty live in Florida. So now your home, you can see your home from, from the town office. Here. I can, yes, <laughs> That's where you yes, grew up. the house I grew up in. I yeah. sure can. I can yeah. see it from uh, where I currently live, across the street. Yeah. Well, well so, tell us about growing up in Cornish. Tell us about your childhood. No, well, Cornish was a wonderful place to grow up. I attended Cornish school grades one through eight. And so that was 1966 through 1974. Um, at the time, there were no, um, there was just eight classrooms in the cafeteria and the two front offices at the time. Um, the school was much smaller with a population of probably around 260 children. So um, looking back now, I think, how did we all fit, you know? That was with, before the gym. That was before the gym, and that was before a few other additions that are on the school right now. Mm. So, and um, Graham Ackerman made homemade meals with her daughter, Norma, um, and that was the hot lunch program at the school. So, and uh, so that's my, my fond memories of the school growing up. Um, Cornish, like I said, was wonderful, the Cornish Fair. I think I attended that my first year when I was seven, and uh, obviously it was much smaller then and, and run by what was the PTA. And uh, um, they had the two fire stations, one up in Cornish Flat and one by where the highway garage is now. And uh, that was where it was prior to where the current police and fire station are located on Townhouse Road. So, and uh, fond memories of playing in the road, which I would not allow my children to do growing up, but there was hardly any traffic. You know, it was mm. kind of a, um, a amazement when a car went by. Was this always a state road? It was, as far <laughs> as I can remember, state at least f as far back as I can remember. Mm. Uh, I had the opportunity to babysit for several families in town. Um, I was, I loved to babysit, and uh, the kids were always fun to be with, and uh, so I had that opportunity also. And then I went to high school at Stevens High School. The town at the time was sort of split in half, so anyone west of Center Road went to Windsor, and anyone east of Center Road went to Stevens High School, although there were kids that kind of went, you know, um, you know, might have gone to Windsor if they lived up in the flat or something. Um, 
and transportation was um, by a bus at the end of Townhouse Road. You paid a quarter to get on and, uh, and a quarter to get home, and you had to be picked up at the corner of Townhouse and uh, Route 120. Mm. So, mm. yeah. So tell us, uh, I always like to ask, um, as you said, people on one side of town would go to Claremont, mm -hmm. the other side to Windsor. Uh, tell us about what we, your early memories of Claremont. Claremont. I remember the Toy Castle as you come off of um, uh, the first intersection after you go by the Disnard School. And uh, the Toy Castle sat on the left-hand side. And it was now, what just was a, the Toy Castle? Toy Castle was this, it looked like a castle. And it was full of toys. It was full of bicycles and toys. And it had a, um, when you walked in the front door, it had a train track that ran around the inside, and it had a loft, but it was looked like a castle. And uh, it mm. was just the most amazing building. Um, Merle Boardman, who, who lives in Claremont and grew up here in town also, has wonderful pictures, history um, of Claremont, and one of the pictures is of the toy castle. And uh, it certainly brings back many fond memories as a young child going in there and picking out a new bicycle. And uh, what, what happened to the toy castle? So it actually got torn down. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it was torn down and replaced by the current apartments there, or if it was torn down for another reason. I don't know. Hmm. Um, but I remember Claremont as being much smaller. You know, it had the corner bookstore as you went around the, the downtown. The common, area. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And a candy store. Um, I can't think of the folks' name, but uh, the uh, Boshas, I think. Um, the candy store on, on the corner around the common there. And uh, it was just a, this much smaller. And, uh, you know, it has grown, and of course, a lot of the stores are empty. Um, I can remember the Joy Foundry being there. and. Uh, some of the historic fires that happened there as my dad was in the fire department, so... Um, was this before uh, the, the big development going out in Washington? Oh, Street? yes, yes, so, yep, yeah. yep. When I was a um, senior in high school, I participated in a health program at, um, for, for, what, for one of my classes. And Golden Cross Ambulance was when you first went out onto Washington Street was on the right hand side. It would have been probably in the area of the empty Rite Aid building, right in that area. And uh, so it was, it was out of a garage and they had one, I think one ambulance, maybe two. And uh, I remember with fond memories being there and thinking, well, the health field is something I'd like to do. Although for many years I did not do that. So. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, uh, In terms of the, you would have gone to Claremont for your shopping and for entertainment? Yeah, or, we or? didn't go to West Lebanon very often, and for many years when you came down by, um, by, you know, where Home Depot is now, there were none, none of those stores for many years. It was kind of an open field. You remember the open and fields? Or? I remember vaguely the open fields, and I'm not sure if I remember them because I've seen pictures or if I actually remember them. But, um, but n none of those stores were there. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, they, the little mall went in, and then, you know, periodically different, different buildings were built in different, yeah. different places. I've been told from other interviews that there was a drive-in theater out on Washington Street. Yes, there was. Did, did it was a there? wonderful drive-in theater. Did oh, yes, there? yes. Yeah. We went there many times. As dates, probably. Yeah. Dates well, we went family, as or? family once in a while and in high school as big groups and then sometimes as dates. So, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, that was a sad day when that was uh, torn down and, and removed. Um, it was just a wonderful place. It would have been great to have been able to bring my children there and uh, and continue there, to go. Did you go to the theaters downtown too? There were theaters and ah uh, yes, I don't downtown. remember doing that very often, but I do remember the one on Pleasant Street. Pleasant Street. And uh, yeah, I think it had the vel red velvet seats, and uh, mm -hmm. you felt very important sitting there watching a movie. <laughs> so now you mentioned your father before. Um, uh, we, your father was an early member of the uh, Cornish Volunteer Fire Department. He did. He and joined in 1966. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. He he no. He also had a business. Tell us about his fire 
really? He did. He had a business for a period of time in Claremont that um, he worked on fire trucks. Um, Dave Wood was one of his employees and Ginny Gage. And um, Ginny Gage's husband? No, Ginny Gage. Oh, yeah, Ginny. yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. Worked in 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 the office there. Oh, did she? Did she? Yeah. Sorry. So um, and then you know he he worked on trucks. I would stop by sometimes when I was in high school. I think more towards my senior year, and uh, so that's that's what he did for for a long time. Well, you know, I just dawned on me when you went to Ginny Gage. You know, you, you have have a link with with fire trucks in terms of building and repair, because now you're married to, uh, to, to Larry Dingy. That I am, And, and yes. Ginny Gage works in the office. And Ginny Gage works for Larry and has since he, since Larry started his shop right? back in the early 80s in oh, the really? flat, along with Bobby Rice. So, yeah. and of course now he has other employees that are wonderful and uh, so, absolutely. Yeah. And Dave worked there for a while. Yeah, so yeah Dave a, Wood. A yeah, oh yeah, yeah, a lot of history. All right, now, so, um, you grew up and, and you got married, you had children. I do. Okay. And mm -hmm. uh, how many children do you have? I have three children. Um, Shane is my oldest and he's married with two children and lives in Plainfield. He is currently on the Cornish Fire Department. He's the fourth generation in my family to be a volunteer firefighter. So he and his wife, Ashley, um, have two boys. My daughter Ashley and Rick um, are expecting in July, and their first child. Um, they they live up on Levitt Hill. They own a home on Levitt Hill, mm -hmm. and uh, have a wonderful chocolate lab that we love dearly. So their baby is actually due on my birthday in July. Oh, so really? <laughs> I've seen Ashley down at, at Larry's. And shop. Ashley works at Larry's also. Yeah, yeah. I'm she sorry, does you have another child. Do we miss one here? We do. My yeah. youngest daughter, Kelsey, um, and her husband, Zach, have a little girl, Maisie, who's two, and uh, they they live in Windsor and uh, are involved. Where, where did you live then when you were raising your family? I lived um, in the house I grew up in for a short while um, for raising my children. And then um, we bought a house up in Cornish Flat. Um, first house on East Road, if you come off of 120 in the flat across from the Cornish General Store, kind of sits behind the post office. And so my children were basically raised there and it was wonderful. There were lots of kids in the community back then and they were able to catch the bus and uh, get dropped off there. Um, and be able to just be home. That, so. At one time, that was all farmland then behind you, right? It was. Um, the post office was there when I bought the house, when we bought the house, and there was an open field that now has a house on it, and a um, field across the street that now has a house on it. So, but, um, but yeah, it was a great place. The library was there, the store was open, the, the bank store was there. The Powers? Powers Country Store, yeah. And, uh, um, the post office was there, so the kids, you know, had friends in the area, and uh, and my son Shane was um, friends with young Greg Clark, so he spent a bunch of time up on the farm, which was wonderful, and uh, so it was it was a good place to raise the kids. The bank was a bank. The bank was there, bank, yeah. The oh yeah, yeah. And the town office was there. The town office was there. The selectman's too. office. Well, no, that actually um, probably wasn't there much longer but um, but the library and this you know all the all those things for the kids to do they would go up to the dam once in a while and go swimming in the summer and uh, yeah it was great yeah. you know we've um, gotten a little ahead of ourselves here I wanted to did ask you about one thing of course we're now at the town office mm -hmm. and uh, you and Scott Baker and John Hammond very nicely um, invited the Historical Society to set up an exhibit here. Yes. Um, and, yes. Uh, and learning about the history of this. And I know you were, you've you been very helpful. You were very helpful. Oh, thank that, you. That. Mm. And uh, of course, at one time, this was a Grange building. It was. It was a church before that. And then, and then the Grange, now, now yeah. You, you, you mentioned mm -hmm. what, you have some memories of coming here for Grange parties. Oh, sure. When we were younger, the um, I think the Grange might have hosted it or the PTA at the time. They used to do a Halloween party in the upstairs of this building, right here. Um, where, where we are. And uh, it was always fun. Um, my parents would do, help us do costumes and 
because we live so close by, we'd walk here and uh, spend the evening. Um, and there were dances here once in a while. You remember that? Oh yeah, yeah. Not very often. My uh, my fonder memories of our of the Halloween parties. The Halloween parties. So, which um, was nice when we moved to the flat and my children were growing up because the flat was so active with Halloween. You know, we would get over two hundred trick or treaters. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, wow. So Halloween was always a, a fun time growing up. Okay. Um, we did go back a little in time, but I didn't want to include that. Now, um, mm-hmm. you know, you raised your family here. Mm-hmm. Um, you served uh, on the select board and then with the, we worked at the school. But before we get into those activities, I wanted to ask you about your volunteer activities here in, uh, um, in Cornish. Yeah, you I start, was... You start with whatever... What's yep. the, the, uh, the fire department? The fire department. With your father. Yes. yes, yep. I joined the fire department um, and was a member there for 20 years. And uh, the volunteer fire department, I went through the state level one class and uh, got my CDL license. And so um, had some good footsteps to follow um, as I came in just as Polly Rand was retiring into the fire department. So. Um, she had set a nice pathway for me and in being a member of the fire department. Was she, and, was she in the fire department with them when John was the chief? Oh yeah, she was. Okay, yeah. That's what I yeah. Yep. Yeah. So so um, so a member of the fire department. I've been a member of the Cornish Rescue Squad for several can years. I, can I just ask you more mm-hmm. about the fire department? Sure. Um, any members memories of particular fires that would have been more spectacular than others? Well, or things like it was that? a very active time when I first joined. There were several structure fires, um, you know, in, in town and, and mutual aid calls. Um, you know, I think the first structure fire I went into was quite an eye-opener for me. I'd been to live berms before, but they're not the same. So um, it was quite an experience. You know, I'd prefer not to, to get into details of people's names, but, um, but you know, I think that um, each fire had its own memory of, you know, different aspects of it and, uh, um, you know, making sure people were able to get out and that's, that's been an ongoing concern of mine and I'm a big push for smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors and we have available at the Cornish School um, Batteries for smoke detectors, free of charge, uh, donated by the Cornish um, Fire Department, and um, smoke detectors donated by Dingy Machine um, that are available free. Um, just give me a call or come up and see me. And uh, so um, it's very important for yes, me to, yes. to see that people have those. Tell, uh, not everyone probably so. is a so aware of this. Tell us about the organization of the fire department in Cornish. It is separate from the town government. No, it is actually part of the town. Um, Um, The fire department is part of the town. It's under the town's umbrella and it receives its funding through tax dollars um, that voted on every year at town meeting. Um, A lot of the equipment was donated over the years by the ladies auxiliary who was a separate entity and did a lot of fundraising um, and did a lot for the the fire department. Uh, The fire department has a fire department association which is separate from the town Mm -hmm. and they too used to do fundraising. They did bingo here in town for a long, long time. And um, so Mike Manette was a big, big, organizer of the, the bingo that raised a lot of money for the but, association. Do they, they, they elect their own fire chief? They do not. The fire the chief is appointed Point by the, the selectmen, selectmen and the rest of the officers are appointed by the members and the members are appointed by the um, fire chief and the officers. Mm-hmm. Um, they've, they, you know, if you want to apply and they're always looking for members, <laughs> Um, training will happen if, if you want to join and you have no experience, they will train you. So, and, uh, you know, I think volunteerism in general has been on a decline. Um, and that's not just here, that's, that's pretty much a, 
across the state. I'd like to get into that more when we talk about changes in corner mm -hmm. fields. Yeah. Um, t tell us now about the uh, First Aid Squad. The Rescue Squad Rescue was squad. founded in 1974. Um, my dad, Ed Lawrence, was one of the founding members along with some other folks here in town. And um, they started, they all joined an EMT class and started the organization. And over the years, um, they were able to, uh, to build the building that houses the uh, rescue truck and equipment. Um, we have monthly meetings. Um, and we're always looking for new members. Um, we've been lucky. There's uh, Jim McGarriger, who is part of our squad has his own business and runs first aid classes and EMT classes. Mm. So, um, you know, there is training available. Um, I also know Dale Gerard out of Claremont Golden Cross um, um, may put together a class and run a class too. So, and that's all volunteer. Both the fire department and the rescue squad are strictly volunteer. There's no f um, financial compensation. I know Jeff Katchen well. And mm -hmm. I know he's oh, active. Jeff, yeah. Yes. yeah? Yes. Yeah. Um, tell us how you're notified of a, of an emergency event. Well, it's changed over the years. Um, when I first joined the fire department, we were notified by Plectron, which was this small black box with a, um, with a little light on it that sent out a tone. And if the tone went out, the red light flashed. And you were notified that way. And then um, pagers that you carried 24-7. And a tone would go out, and you'd hear that. And now you have that option of a pager. Um, we, we have radios also, but we get text on our um, cell phones now. Oh. So, um, which is very convenient for most of us folks that have um, a, a, a cell phone. So we're able to respond. Um, most of the fire department responds to the station to, to get the equipment. And Cornish rescue members respond either to the station to pick up the rescue truck or in their own vehicles, depending upon where they're located in town at the time. And we also cover Plainfield and Meriden with Cornish rescue. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's certainly changed over the years to to have the notified um, be on your cell phone. Much, yeah. much faster now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Now, have we left out any of your volunteer activities? I'm trying to think. I know you've been involved, you know, of course, with the fire department. Yeah, and, and I'm currently the emergency management director. Oh, the yes, current select you. board were kind enough to appoint me to that position. So that is a new position to me, so there'll be a huge learning curve on that. Um, and I work closely with the um, police chief, the fire chief, and lots of times with the road agent. So um, we'll be getting together soon to uh, try to um, figure out what we need to have and put some other pieces in place. Okay. Now, so, um, tell us about your position at the school, what you do there. And, um, um, I've, I'm the administrative assistant or secretary. I, either title works for me. And I've been there 28 years. I started part-time, um, 28 full-time, and then one year part-time when my son was in kindergarten and they were building the new kindergarten. Um, so, um, so my job there is kind of varies. I fill in where, where needed, uh, process purchase orders, timesheets, answer phone calls, and because we are a locked facility, I. Um, register visitors to the school and um, and then buzz them in, so to speak. Mm. So, and a lot of interaction with the kids. Um, my office is located right off the cafeteria, so I get to see the kids every day at lunch. And so work closely with the principal and the staff. I think we and, should quit mention Billy Sharp is a former student. Oh, right? Billy Sharp <laughs> is, yes. He was in my youngest daughter's, Kelsey's class. Oh, oh really? Yeah, and uh, yes, fond memories of Billy um, on author's night, I think in second grade with Mrs. Creary, and uh, um, hard to believe, but I remember, I remember Billy's story, so. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. yeah, oh yes, yep. Now, uh, you also served on the select board. I did, yes. yes. Yep, I served one term, and uh, decided with the changes, with the uh, withdrawing from the SAU, six to our own SAU 100 
I wasn't sure what that would mean for our principal and, and um, you know, her workload and, and my workload, although I don't think mine will be impacted greatly. So I decided not to run again and um, be able to support uh, the principal if need be in a greater capacity and uh, not try to spread myself too thin. Tell us about so, your experiences on the select board. Um, uh, it was a good experience. Um, there's some parts that, uh, you know, you, you look back on and wonder, oh, you know, could I have done something different? But a lot of what the board does is follow the law. And, um, and that's actually, we represent the community, we represent the town and the town's people. And, um, but it's by law. And so, you know, we issue building permits and, uh, and, you know, lots of times folks would just come in to talk or if they had a question, they would come. And it was great. It was, it was a good, good learning process for me. And uh, I think if you have anybody has any thoughts of trying it, they should. Um, it's different to be on that side of the table. Um, but John and Scott were great, and uh, it, was a, it was a good learning. And of course, any particular issues that stand out in your mind that you had to deal with? Any, any, any particularly difficult issues? Or well, I think tax issues are the hardest, um, you know, and when people fall onto hard times and get behind on their taxes, it's not an easy task for the select board to take a piece of property, and it's not our discretion, it's by law. Um, it's mandatory. Um, the only exception would be if there's a risk hazard to taking that piece of property like, um, you know, hazardous waste. The town can refuse it at that time. But, um, but it's very difficult to take someone's property. Um, you don't know what the circumstances are and my heart goes out to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's a very difficult thing and it was difficult for all of us to, to have to face that at times. So, but, um, but yeah, uh, John and Scott were great. Mary is so helpful in her position as administrative assistant. Mary and Tucker. Uh, Mary and Tucker, the dog, yes. Right. Oh, Tucker, yes. <laughs> what a sweet dog. Sure. So. Now, um, let's talk a little about some uh, issues in Cornish in terms of changes. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps in, in school, the most notable change is the decline enrollment. Yes. Yes. Talk about that. Yeah. It, it, when I first started back in the late 80s, there were probably 250 plus or minus kids at the school at the time. And over the years, it's declined. Our enrollment today is 86. Um, you know, there's, I know there's folks that would like to see us um, close the school. I think that would be heartbreaking. I think that would um, take away a huge piece of this community to, to do that. Uh, I think the school is a pillar of the community, and um, I do understand the financial end of it. I pay taxes in town, too. Um, and it would be great to be able to work together to come up with a solution so that that school does not have to close, um, that we can manage it somehow. Um, now, you also, of course, b being a, a, an elected official, um, you know, were part of the process in Cornish whereby Cornish values open space. Yes, yeah. they do. <laughs> now, uh, and they want to mm -hmm. preserve the rural character. Mm -hmm. You know, it's possible that there could be some conflict in, in priorities here between hoping to increase the enrollment and preserving yeah. open space. And, and uh, I uh, see that. Could, would you comment on that? Yeah. Your views on I, that? I understand um, keeping the feel of the town. Um, I also understand that many folks have been able to build their own homes in town. Um, I think it's difficult. The price of property in town is very high. And for a young couple or, you know, older folks, doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be young, uh, to come in and purchase a piece of land, put in a well, put in a driveway, build a house, it, it just may be unreachable for some folks and they end up buying elsewhere. And I think our community may lose out a bit um, because of that, because of the With zoning the ordinances. Zoning the because of the zoning ordinances, that's correct. Yes. Um, it would be great to see some other areas of town be developed um, with maybe less restrictions, my personal opinion. Uh, people always look towards the flat to be, um, you know, the, uh, you know, I know the town 
uh, the, the plan. Um, folks were, I attended the meeting and folks were leaning towards Cornish Flat to being able to be, you know, maybe just an acre and build houses. Well, I wouldn't mind seeing that in other places in town too. Um, I think to be able to preserve open space is great, but not at the expense of losing what we currently have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and with options available um, for smaller houses, I think it's great if we could get some more families in town and um, have a have a larger enrollment. And this would be so, key to reversing the decline of enrollment in the school, um, you think? Well, I, I think oh, it would help. Think, what are your thoughts about uh, will the enrollment continue to increase? Um, it's been steady for a couple of little, I'm saying maybe three or four years. Um, we'll see with our incoming kindergarten and pre-K how mm -hmm. that matches with our outgoing graduating class, which currently is our largest class in the school at um, 16. So we'll see. Um, I'm guessing we won't match that number, but, um, but we have families move in over town, over the summer, excuse me. And there's been a lot of houses sold currently, some are under contract. Um, so we'll see. It sure would be nice to, to break 100 again. <laughs> It'd be greater to break 150 again, but that, that could take a lot of time. I, I'm not advocating so. a position, and there are different views. Do, do you see in the future uh, Cornish cooperating uh, more with Plainfield, for example? That, that might happen. Um, you know, I, I, I'm happy to listen to people's views, um, um, opinions. I uh, just hope that they can see other opinions as well. Um, I think Cornish has a good connection with Plainfield. Um, and I think, you know, the new SAU is, will be hiring services from Plainfield, the superintendent and the business manager, and perhaps sharing a special ed director. Mm -hmm. So there will be some, um, you know, some connection to Plainfield, and we'll see over the years. You know, were you personally in favor of withdrawing from the Claremont SAU? I had some mixed feelings. Um, being a, a, a member of the school faculty um, for you know so many years, I depended on the SAU for many things. Do I think we'll be all right? Yes, I think we'll do just fine. I think you know everybody has worked very hard through this transition to make it happen and make it be smooth. Um, and I think in the end it'll be fine. Um, there's some connections at the SAU that I will miss. Um, some help that I have received from you know different departments. So it will be different for me not to be able to just pick up my phone and, well, and dial that number. But, well, maybe working with Plainfield would lead to a greater cooperation Yes. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, here we are. We're our own SAU as of July 1st, and we'll make it work. We'll, we'll be okay. Good. So, Good. yeah. Well, um, for the town and for the school, I mean, we've talked about the, uh, you know, the challenge for declining enrollment. Well, what do you think are the challenges going forward? What are, are the possible problems or the things that people will have to, will have to deal with? Well, I think small classes, um, some folks view them as being um, an advantage. And I think it can be an advantage to a certain point. Um, but I also think that having more children in a class is, is, is a good thing. Um, I know when my kids went to school, and as Billy remembers, um, my children's classes were so large that they were actually split in half. Um, so they had, you know, the two second grades or combination classes. And um, so I, I think what we need to do is work together to try to figure out how to keep costs down and taxes down so that those who may be hesitant to support keeping the school open maybe see a different, different way to do so. Um, and uh, so it... It, I think it's going to take thinking outside the box, and um, everybody has been very good. We have so many folks in town that, um, you know, are supportive, and those who maybe don't support it, um, I can understand their side of it too. Um, I just hope that we can pull it all together and uh, make it work. So. Well, you've certainly done yeah. your part. Well, I've enjoyed it. It's been a wonderful job. Um, I enjoy those kids so much and the staff. 
And it's hard to believe how many kids have graduated or, or moved on to other schools over the years that uh, I've had contact with. And now people like Billy have come and back. And here he is, yeah. and how yeah. wonderful is that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. absolutely. I enjoyed them a lot. You know, one thing when I've asked other people about changes in Cornish, um, some of them have mentioned the roads. Mm. The roads have improved so much, and they remember the old, you know, of course, yeah. you still have muddy but mud. Right, know, right. Oh, sure. But, but you primarily have, would have lived on paved roads. And I grew up on a paved road, right, so, right, yeah, so. Um, I do remember South Deming Road early on, back in the you know, late 60s, early 70s was usually one of the last ones plowed, so my brothers would um, take a snowmobile up to the end of the road. At the time, there was only one house up there back in the, the 60s, um, the big farmhouse at the end, and they would pick up the folks who left their car at the bottom of the road, bring them down so they could go off to work. Yeah. And uh, we were able to slide on that road. And then a mud season too, must have been. Oh, and I'm sure mud season, yeah. That I don't remember. Um, I remember walking up there frequently. A friend People will comment there. on that, that, that they, that's a great change. They know oh, the yeah, they yeah, I'm sure live those who off, live, off the, yeah, roads, yeah. live on dirt roads are appreciative of, of the, um, yes. the care they get now. So, and the change there. So. Well, I, I certainly have enjoyed the interview. I, I didn't realize you had been at the school for 28 years. Oh, yes. That's quite yes. remarkable. Oh, thank you. Know, you. It's that period of continuity. Yeah, lots of changes over the years. Um, yeah. You know, some I've smiled at, some I haven't smiled at, but uh, in the end, uh, we're there for the kids. And Hairstyles so. change, don't they? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. hairstyles have changed. Clothing has changed. You know, it kind of makes its way back around every now and then. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just fun to, to watch kids grow. Well, thank so. you for your, thank you. We'll be happy to, no, thank you for your service. But is there anything else you would like to add? I think, I think I've covered it. Oh, I've, I just want to say, Laird, that I thank you for, for your part in bringing forward a lot of folks in town to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had the opportunity to watch several of them and have enjoyed them. Most of the folks that you've interviewed are folks that I've known for years, oh. and so it's been fun to, to listen to them and uh, get their take on how the town has changed and what their life has been. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Billy, uh, we always say at the end of an interview, well, Billy, that's a take. 